Welcome to the Tradie Wife Life podcast, brought to you by Tradies in Business, where we talk to tradie wives about their goals, their challenges, their hopes and dreams, and how their trade business can help with that. Hello, listeners. I have a different kind of episode for you today. First of all, the second voice you'll hear on this guest interview is not a lady's voice, which is very rare. And you're going to get a whole bunch more of that this year as we strive to bring you the very best quality guests that we can. Sometimes they happen to be the opposite sex, not always ladies. I know, please don't choke. Sometimes maybe it could always be ladies, but anyway, we won't today. Uh, I'm today joined by Rakesh from Aureus Financial. Rakesh is an accountant. Now, I don't want you to want because he's actually a really interesting dude and he's got so much more in common with all of us as trading wives than you might think. And... Before we get into Rakesh's point of view and what we'll be talking about here today, I really wanted to start off the episode by reaffirming something that I say really frequently, particularly in the live events that Warwick and I do for Traders in Business, and that is if you are the wife or the partner of a tradie who owns a business, you should not be doing his book work unless you are a registered bookkeeper. Now, this statement gets me in trouble all the time. It gets me in trouble with two crowds of people. One, there are some ladies out there, some trading wives, some trading partners who really enjoy the bookwork side of what you're doing. And then there are others who think that's the only way they can stay connected to the business. And I'm here to tell you, it is not always your best place in the business. Unless you're a registered bookkeeper, you might be really good at it. And there are other professionals out there that can help you that will work closely with your accountant, with your financial team to provide you the results that you are looking for. And you have a whole handful of other skills that you can utilize in your business in a way that can contribute to the change that you're looking for in your business rather than getting stuck doing something like the bookkeeping. So now that we've got that open, and I'm blaming totally myself for that, I'm not even going to tell you whether Rakesh agrees with me or not. We did have a chat off air. Rakesh, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Nicole. It's a pleasure Absolutely. to be here. Now, we were chatting off air about bookkeeping, and I think what I, I took from the conversation that we had is that we have the opportunity as trade business owners to have a financial team. It's not really just the accountant, not really just the bookkeeper, not really just somebody that's working with us with wealth planning, say in the financial planning space, or a business coach that might be there to help you. I think it's a combination of all of those services that can really drive the best result for trade business owners. But do you agree with me? Definitely. Uh, in in the past, what I've experienced is where you have uh, that that team may be a bunch of individuals, and they don't collaboratively uh, work together for the client's best or in the client's best interests. Mm-hmm. Uh, you tend to have friction where you've got someone who won't share information with another party, and it just ultimately everyone else is benefiting and the client is pretty much drawing the the short straw in that equation uh, and it's not getting them the best outcome. So ideally you want that team that works effectively together and gets the client the best outcome. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I've seen this on many occasions as coaches, we're often asking for financial data from our clients so that we get, because it's the best way for us to understand how well a business is doing. We can see stuff in their financials that give us an indication to the future performance of the business, even if it's only in the medium term, not necessarily the long term. But that data can be slow to come because a bookkeeper is playing gatekeeper and doesn't want to uh, share that information because I don't know why they feel threatened or accountants in their experience have done the same. And I think it comes back to that relationship between those key people that we just spoke about on a team. If they don't have a relationship and we haven't come together in collaboration for the client, we can all be quite guarded around the roles that we individually play, which unfortunately has a negative outcome for the client. Exactly. You could have someone who, I've seen this from particularly an accounting perspective, where the accountant will not share information with the financial advisor because for whatever reason, maybe it's an ego thing. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the financial advisor then has to go you know, they, they've they got to take a longer route to get to the same result. And sometimes it's it's probably not the most informed advice that they can give their client because they don't have the full uh, log of information. Mm. Uh, occasionally you see bookkeepers do something similar and 
I, I get why they do it. The the bookkeeper is looking after the the books. You know, the, the financial. Let's say, for example, if they're using Zero or MYOB QuickBooks, uh, they're putting a fair bit of work into making sure that the the file is accurate. Yes. Uh, along comes the accountant, and they're like, "Well, you know, we we don't use these Zeros and MyOBs and QuickBooks of the world. We're we're using a legacy based system, and." We're just going to take the data from the accounting file and put it into our system and give you a set of financial statements. So technically, you're waiting 12 months, maybe more, depending on when they lodge the return, to actually get a set of meaningful reports which can tell you a story about how your business is performing. Not great. No, it's not. I think that, unfortunately, I, you know what? We also spoke briefly about this before. The financial literacy around being a business owner is not something that we're taught. Now, if I think about the trades, I have a, a, a son who is a, he's an apprentice carpenter. He's in his third year. He's taught nothing about what it's like when he finishes his time and he becomes generally a sole trader, which many of them do. He'll go off and subcontract for somebody. He'll be responsible for all of his financials, but he doesn't understand any of that. And not because he's not a very intelligent, well-educated young man, but because this isn't part of the education within their apprenticeship or their traineeship. Likewise, when we see people go on to be business owners, there's no prerequisite for them to do that training to have the financial literacy. And then we get into this space where we don't know and we don't know what we don't know. So we get stuck feeling uncomfortable asking for assistance because we don't know what we should be asking for and we wouldn't necessarily understand it when we see it anyway. I, I did the same thing for myself. For many, many years, I found it uncomfortable. I knew the figures weren't going to say what I wanted them to say, so I avoided them like the plague. And it just means that you dig a bigger hole for yourself at the end of the day. Um, and so I feel as though whilst, as particularly as tradies, we, we have this thought process that we can fix everything. That's often why we went into the trades in the first place. And as partners, so if I speak to our listeners as tradie wives and tradie partners, Generally, we feel as though we have a place to be able to assist in the business, to be able to help out, and it usually starts with doing some of the data entry. Now, I don't want to confuse the data entry with bookkeeping because I feel they're two very separate tasks. I think data entry is okay, provided it is done under the guidance of a bookkeeper because you want everything to be coded correctly so that, like you referenced before, the file is clean when it goes to the accountant. But it's all well and good for me to say all of this, Rakesh. I would love to understand from an accountant's point of view, what gives the best outcome for the business owner and how do we find the right people to deliver that best outcome? Okay. The, uh, the, the best outcome would be where you've got a bookkeeper and your accountant working in unison with each other. They're, they're communicating fairly frequently. Um, the, some of the relationships we've got with bookkeepers who are external to ourselves, uh, we catch up probably on a monthly basis, even if it's just a 15 minute chat, you know, what's working well, what's not working, are there any particularly big transactions we should be aware of? At least you're not then waiting 12 months and a couple of vehicles were bought at ridiculous interest rates and, you know, all sorts of things have happened in that period and then the accountant's like, well, it's too late for us to do anything about it. Um, the other thing is that the bookkeeper should really be chatting with the business owner or someone on the business owner's team at least on a weekly basis, mm -hmm. uh, chat, chatting, communicating. So it could be email or phone call because your, your bookkeeper is, is at the call face. They, they're the ones that see all of the transactions that are going through the bank accounts and they're basically coding that so that it tells the business owner a story about whether they're doing well or they need to pull up their socks, whether it's from a billing perspective or cash collections perspective. And the number of people who do not look at the balance sheet, uh, it astounds me. Uh, the other day, the conversation went along the lines of, you know, when was the last time you checked your debtors in the balance sheet? What are debtors? What's a balance sheet? Uh, anyway, for the listeners, your profit and loss statement is generally a statement that tells you how your business is performing. And your balance sheet is a financial statement which tells you what sort of position your business is in. Ideally, you want your assets to be higher than your liabilities, but if you've got things that are being coded for, for example, uh, if the business owner is not paying themselves through payroll or through the wages system and they're taking drawings, that will sit on the balance sheet as an asset. So you'd think that 
you know, we're actually doing better than we really are. Uh, so the the story that you're being told when none of that is happening uh, from the outset can then become very convoluted, especially as time passes and you're not doing a check-in with someone on your financial team. Uh, so within Warriors, we, we work for, there are some clients that we do not do the, the bookkeeping or accounting work for. Uh, and then we have the, the wealth team who touch base and they let us know that, you know, this client is in, uh, for example, they make an introduction, we'll have a chat with that client and they can identify that there's something that's not right. For example, uh, you could have invoices that are being raised, particularly within the, the bookkeeping. So this is where, like you mentioned, the data entry element, um, someone on the client's team, whether it's their wife or someone else, uh, is raising the invoice that then gets sent to the client. The client then makes payment of that invoice. And because it comes in uh, into the bank account, it may not get reconciled against that invoice. So it's picked up as a receive money transaction, which essentially means that the financials are now showing double what revenue they should have shown. And the bank account is telling a completely different story. And so goes the process. And come 30th of June, we're like, oh, we made all this money. And then you've got debtors up the wazoo and you know you haven't paid people, particularly the ATO. It then becomes a very complex situation to navigate. Easily prevented though. It is easily preventable. It just requires a bit of help. And I guess maybe from an accountant's point of view, you could explain to us why it's so important that uh, that you receive a clean file. Like what's the benefit to the end business owner there? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll be blunt. Um, we like an hourly rate for an accountant versus what a bookkeeper would, would normally charge. Uh, they are vastly different. Uh, and I'm not I'm not flogging bookkeepers. Uh, you know, we we do bookie, bookkeeping ourselves in the business. Uh, bookkeepers are are very vital to the process, but for whatever reason, qualifications, experience, all of that, uh, an accountant has a higher charge out rate. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have different levels of accountants within the business. So a job when we put that out, you know, processing through to review and then finalization and meeting with our clients would involve. Uh, an array of different charge out rates. Mm -hmm. Each one of those charge out rates is higher than a standard bookkeeping charge out rate. So for us to then fix something that hasn't been done by the bookkeeper initially uh, is is going to cost the client more in the long run. So ideally having those, those clean books on the outset would cost the client less if they were done proactively on an ongoing basis than uh, it's that whole analogy of you know, it's easier to to prevent something than have to fix the the mess that's created off the back of it. Yes. And now the ATO is being particularly more um, they're not as lenient as they used to be, even a couple of years ago. So if you've not had BASs lodged, if your super hasn't been paid on time, uh, if you've got payments that are outstanding and you've not actually entered into any sort of uh, arrangement with the ATO, uh, they, they're penalizing left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. And is that a cost that a business owner really needs, particularly if they're trying to make ends meet or at least build a profit into their business? Mm -hmm. uh, the current economy, uh, <laughs> that, that can be a bit of a struggle. Mm, totally. It's a very um, complex issue. The whole tax law, the compliance law, it's all very, very complicated. And I guess perhaps it's reassuring. It was reassuring for me when I first started helping out in what was then our business, building business. I did the exact same thing. I started out by helping out with the book. So I did the data entry, but I knew at that point, I actually don't like it. I can't stick it. It's not in my skill set. It's not something that I enjoy doing regularly. So we always outsource the reconciliation and preparing for bass and all of that kind of stuff that needed to be done. And I would just stick to the data entry. But even within the data entry, I would make errors because this is not my strong suit. It's not where all my magical powers lay. And so it ended up costing us more money, fortunately, only at the bookkeeper point of view before it then went off to the accountant. We were also really fortunate and lucky to fall into a relationship with our bookkeeper that meant we had access to her accountant who is now, he's like my grandfather or my dad. He's an amazing man. He's a very big part of our family. He works hand in hand with us for our business. And I think that it's really important to understand that there needs to be a team to assist you 
to drive those business results that you are looking for because you're not meant to know. It's very convoluted. Tax law is very hard to understand. It's very complicated to navigate. And when we bring in compliance, like there's several different stories here that we're talking about from an accounting point of view, and you're not meant to know. And I think that, you know, when I figured out that I wasn't meant to know, it was okay that this wasn't in my wheelhouse and it wasn't my strong suit. I was able to let it go, allow somebody else to look after it for me. And we got a far better result than I could have ever generated. So Rakesh, I, I guess... The question begs now, well, how do you find, you know, if somebody's listening to this and they're currently doing all of the book work, acting as the bookkeeper in the business, they you know what, I'm, this isn't my strong suit, I don't need to be doing this. How do you find a good bookkeeper or how do you find a good accountant? Because I think that the, the relationship between the two need to be quite similar. Where do you start? What are you looking for? Uh, good question. I, I could do a shameless plug. <laughs> both uh, for my, myself <laughs> feel free to reach out to us at uh, Orius Financial but in all seriousness if you have a, a working relationship with someone who is very interested in your business uh, what happens on a day to day basis urges you to set up uh, have your banking set up in, in such a way that you're provisioning for upcoming liabilities they're going into your file at least on a weekly basis uh, they're easy to communicate with, and uh, I use the word accountantese uh, when when communicating with, with some of our clients. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to use accountantese. I I end up using accountantese because I, I think it's just it's deeply ingrained. But ultimately, you want the people that you're dealing with from a service provider perspective to to communicate in a way that you actually understand. Um, and so I find that using analogies and uh, telling stories around that, uh, I actually put through, put together an analogy. Uh, I'll just run one by you: uh, cash flow management. So the the simple explanation I've got here is: imagine your business as a water tank with money flowing in from the tap, which is your income from your jobs and services, and flowing out through a few holes, being expenses like material, wages, rent. Cash flow management is making sure your tank doesn't run dry by balancing the water coming in and going out. Mm. So um, th those kind of analogies, obviously, th that's a very rehearsed one. Uh, wh when you're in the thick of it and having the conversation with your, your clients, or when I do it with my clients, uh, try and be blunt, but at the same time, understanding where they, they're coming from. And uh, if, if I can, again, be a little bit more... Uh, I'll, I'll part with you some of the, the things we do with our clients, but when whenever we start an engagement with the client, we always start with where you're now, where do you want to get to, and then map the journey from here to there. Uh, ideally, if you don't do that, you're not factoring in all of the other advisors or um, the, the finance team. And, and I use finance team, to, that includes coaches. Um, you might have accountants who are different from, from us. Ideally, everyone is then included in that equation, and we then start building the relationships together because ideally your your bookkeeper or accountant should be someone that you can build a lifelong relationship with because as your business grows, their business grows. If they see you as someone with a pulse and a checkbook, uh, that's definitely not the, the kind of relationship you want to have with them because it's very transactional. Uh, anything can happen and then you're it's a competition to to the bottom they, they just be undercutting their prices in order to win your work and not delivering a quality service because everything's being rushed and uh, you're the one as a client that's that's losing out at the end of the day okay i'm going to ask a question that i've wanted to ask an accountant for ages and you're so easy to talk to you get to be the one that i ask rakesh and that is By the way. i see i sit in a very different position on the financial piece than most financial professionals and so a very close relationships with our clients and we see a lot of shame and fear around money and we watch that unfortunately prevent some bigger conversations that could mm, unmask and help explain and get clarity on their current position and how to build a plan to get out of that. So I want to ask you the direct question as an accountant when you're looking at a set of figures are you making judgments about the business owners and their own personal or self-worth? Never. Uh, I would never do that because I know that they are, like, my wife would probably have a field day with this, so I'm glad she's not <laughs> listening. Uh, I can't put up 
let's say the shelves that I've bought from Ikea, or I tried to do a, one of those, um, like a coat rack the other day. Yeah. And it took me an hour. Uh, something that should normally take like 15, 20 minutes. And I realized knowing, well, I, I realized that as, uh, you know, trades professionals, they're good at what they do out there. And I know that numbers is not something that has been, like, even in, in school, we, we're never educated on the financial literacy side of things. I feel like the system has been created so that we stay in jobs and we never build, like, long, you know, wealth that will take us into the future. Absolutely. But, anyway, that, that's probably a topic for a different time. But um, ideally, if we see a set of financial, there's, there's no judgments because we know that the, the clients we're working with are coming to us to help them and to be uh, that, that expert in their corner mm. uh, so that they can run the best business that they uh, they can run. I couldn't agree more. I There is no shame in asking for help and often we don't know where to go first for help. And I would suggest that if you have a trade business and you're listening to this and it's not performing the way that you want it to, there are many professionals that can help you in this particular space. Start with your accountant. Reach out to us here at Traders and Business. Reach out to Aureus Financial. Uh, go and join Facebook groups because there's lots of people talking about this financial literacy piece and what, you know, even the very spreadsheets that we talk about as business coaches mean for your business and how that can help drive change. And we talk frequently on on what role each of the professionals should make in your team. There's lots of questions that could be answered and you don't need to even put your hand up to begin with and ask for help. So I think it's really important that they understand, anybody listening understands that there isn't the judgment that you feel that there is. That's generally a self-judgment because you're not comfortable with where you've been, but you're taking the first step by being vulnerable and putting your hand up and asking for help to change that outcome so it doesn't look the same moving forward. Uh, Rakesh, this has been really insightful and I want to just give a plug. Rakesh is going to be joining us over on the Tradies and Business podcast as well. Well, I don't reckon I'm going to get a word in because between you and Warwick talking about all the financial stuff, I might get a little yawny in the corner. No, I would never do that to you. I might do it to Warwick. Um, we will have a big, broader conversation about wealth planning and how your business is the best asset you have to drive the lifestyle that you were looking for. Today, we really wanted to nut down and just look at why you, the tradie wife or the tradie partner, should consider giving up the bookkeeping if you're currently doing it. And if you already have a bookkeeper, understanding whether they're playing part of a bigger part of your team or whether you're just sort of, you know, pigeonholing yourself with one or two professionals. What does your entire team look like? Um, so Rakesh, thank you very much for joining me here today. I look forward to speaking to you again over on Tradies and Business. Can you tell our listeners where they can find you if they want to learn more about Aureus Financial? Uh, certainly. Uh, we, if you visit our website, aureusfinancial.com.au, uh, you'll see our contact details on there. Uh, you can email me direct if you need to. I'll give you my mobile number if that's okay. Uh, 0427 uh, Feel free to reach out to rakesh.nan at aureusfinancial.com.au. Uh, I'm available on LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, I think Instagram. So yeah, there's a lot of cat videos on, on Instagram. So. <laughs> <laughs> Love that, Rakesh. And listeners, we'll make sure all of Rakesh's details are, are in the show notes for you. Rakesh is super approachable. If you've ever been concerned about your financials and you just want to have a chat, start the process for creating something different for you in your future. Rakesh is the man to talk to. Please check the the um, show notes and reach out to him. Thanks again, Rakesh. Appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, Nicole. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>